Some of you know I've been away from Westmont on sabbatical this semester, and I traveled back yesterday to attend this conference. Um, I think I had coffee breath yesterday while I was traveling. Um, I, I think this because the woman sitting next to me on the flight out of Montreal, after a couple of hours, took out a packet of gum, and she offered me a stick. <laughs> and then she took one for herself. Um, that broke the ice a little bit, and so we got chatting. She asked if I was going to California for business reasons or personal reasons. I said, oh, a bit of both. It's an academic conference. Uh, to be polite, I asked her, same question. She paused and made a sort of face and said it was for personal reasons, sort of. She was going to collect a medal. I said, oh, well, congratulations. She said, well, uh, it's medal's not for me. Uh, the medal was awarded to her son, who was killed uh, several years ago when he was with Marines in Iraq. Uh, he had been first trained as a navigator, but, uh, and so he was in sort of safe work, but uh, when an older cousin died in Iraq, he said he didn't want to be confined to safe duties. He petitioned for frontline duties and was trained for 18 months and then uh, went to Iraq and then a month and a half in, he was shot by a sniper. He was awarded a medal posthumously and she was now going to collect it. She told me his name, she showed me his picture and said he was a beautiful person inside and out. His name was Jonathan. Uh, emotionally, I was really stopped in the tracks by this uh, example of the personal face of warfare. Uh, partly I think this is because philosophers who love abstract argumentation just find it very easy to forget about the personal face of warfare. But one reason I'm pleased to have our speaker this afternoon is that he has not forgotten about these things, even in writings that are marked by erudition and careful historical argument. In chapter nine of his book, Just and Unjust Wars, where he discusses five real historical cases where snipers had a chance to shoot other soldiers but hesitated to do so for what seemed like personal reasons. Uh, one was taking a bath, one soldier was just wandering in the sun, one was having a cigarette, uh, one was running and holding up his pants and looked funny. <laughs> and in each case, the sniper who could have shot them held back. Reflecting on these cases, our speaker writes, it is not against the rules of war, as we currently understand them, to kill soldiers who look funny, who are taking a bath, who hold up their pants, who are reveling in the sun, smoking a cigarette. The refusal of these five men, nevertheless, goes to the heart of the war convention. For what does it mean to say that someone has a right to life? To say that is to recognize a fellow creature who is not threatening me, whose activities have the savor of peace and camaraderie, whose person is as valuable as my own. An enemy has to be described differently. That was written by our keynote speaker today, Michael Waltzer, Professor Emeritus at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, one of America's foremost political thinkers, Michael Waltzer has written about a wide variety of topics in political theory and moral philosophy, political obligation, nationalism and ethnicity, distributive justice, uh, he has, to date, published over 300 articles and essays and book reviews in Dissent, The New Republic, New York Review of Books, New Yorker, New York Times, Harper's, as well as really all the major philosophy and political science journals. He's authored or co-authored uh, 27 books, including The Revolution of the Saints, Spheres of Justice, What It Means to Be an American, On Toleration, The Jewish Political Tradition, and most recently, In God's Shadow, Politics in the Hebrew Bible. But most pertinently for our purposes today, in 1977, he published the modern classic, Just and Unjust Wars, now in its fourth edition. Uh, in calling it a classic, uh, I don't mean the insult, that uh, it's the sort of thing written in a dead language and that no one reads and that only gathers dust. Uh, this is the sort of classic that in my field you simply have to have read if you're going to join the debate about ethics and warfare. He received a BA in history from Brandeis University, attended Cambridge University on a Fulbright fellowship, and then received a PhD in government from Harvard. 
He taught at Princeton from 1962 to 1966, then at Harvard from 67 to 1980, when he was uh, appointed permanent faculty member in the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, he's married to Judith Borodovko Walzer, who has accompanied him this weekend, and we are delighted to host them both at the Gady Institute and here at Westmont College. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you very much. Um, so I am very pleased to be beginning this uh, conversation. I'm, I'm going to begin it with a, a very argumentative talk. Um, I grew up in a tradition where all conversations were arguments. <laughs> and um, I've learned that arguments, even very strong arguments, uh, can um, produce mutual understanding, not, they don't have to produce mutual destruction. So what is just war theory about? That's my subject, and I never would have thought of asking this question. But now that just war theory is a small academic industry, the question seems important. There are at least two answers, one of which I want to defend as strongly as I can. The first answer is that just war theory is about war. And the second answer is that just war theory is about just war theory. The difference is most simply a matter of focus toward what issues, what hard questions, what specific circumstances is the theorist's attention directed. But we might also think of it in a backward looking way. What was the theorist reading? before he or she began writing. And I will begin with this matter of, of reading, or better, with the theorist's reading matter. And since I bear some small responsibility for the academic industry, I will begin autobiographically with my own reading matter. Um, I had hoped that uh, Jean Elstein would, would be here. She also bears some small responsibility for the academic industry, and I think um, if she were to res reflect autobiographically on her reading matter, she would have the same, she would tell the same story that I'm about to tell. Before I wrote Just and Unjust Wars, I read some key texts in Catholic moral theology and in early international law. Augustine, Aquinas, and the Spanish Dominican Vittoria, Grotius and Puffendorf and a few others. I read a handful of 19th and 20th century legal textbooks and a couple of contemporary theorists like Paul Ramsey, who was the most important Protestant writer on war in the 1950s and 60s. But the greater part by far of my reading was not in theory at all, but in military history, both academic and popular, and then in the memoir literature produced by soldiers of different ranks, but preferably the lower ranks, junior officers and foot soldiers who make the toughest moral decisions on the battlefield. And then in wartime journalism and commentary, especially about Vietnam, which was the immediate occasion of my own writing. And finally, I read many of the novels and poems that deal with the experience of fighting and the company of soldiers. These latter non-theoretical genres and the books and articles they include seem to me the critically necessary material for my project, partly because I had never been a soldier myself and I needed to learn as much as I could about the experience of war. But I also focused on these histories, memoirs, essays, novels, and poems because I wanted the moral arguments of my own book to ring true to their authors and to the men and women about whom they were writing. Looking over the recent flood, well, flood, it's an exaggeration, but that's how it feels to someone who came of age in a different time Looking over the recent flood of books and articles about justice and injustice in war, my sense is that the authors are not reading 
in anything like the way I did. The literature, the literature that they are preoccupied with is the academic literature about moral philosophy and just war theory. They are reading the journals, not the journalists. They are reading each other. It's a common academic practice, but one that always seems to me problematic, especially so when the subject is politics and war. And then they are arguing with each other, disagreeing about significant theoretical points and about fine points, too. Some of the disagreements are about ethical issues um, like self-defense self and responsibility, personal responsibility, issues that arise not only in wartime but in many ordinary domestic contexts. And it seems to be the view of these theorists, or many of them, that issues of this sort can be delineated most clearly and addressed most conclusively in contexts far removed from war and even in hypothetical contexts and in elaborately constructed cases that have no historical or practical reference at all. So there's no need for them to read, say, military history. The debate is focused elsewhere and all that is necessary is to read the work of the other participants in the debate. I don't want to deny the possible usefulness of this sort of philosophical labor. Issues that arise in war, but also in other real and imagined contexts, can certainly be addressed, illuminated, and perhaps even resolved in the other contexts. What I worry about is that the illuminations and resolutions won't ring true to the people I've always tried to address for whom war is a primary subject and a personal experience. How can that be? Surely if we have figured out what personal responsibility, for example, means in the way that contemporary philosophers figure things out by abstracting from particular cases by inventing examples that test every possible definition, by calling each other to account with more and more refined examples, then we also know what personal responsibility means in war. There's no point in reading historical analyses or subjective accounts of military decision making or fictional narratives about combat, since none of these are designed for philosophical purposes. What counts is the cleverness of the, of the design and the questions that it highlights and helps us answer. For these theorists, war doesn't come first, just as traffic accidents, say, or marital disputes don't come first in the study of the law. For lawyers, civil law comes first, and what is critically important is to get the legal rules that govern civil society and domestic affairs right, and then, and then apply them, apply those rules to particular cases. That order is plausible enough for traffic accidents and marital disputes, even though the law gets interpreted and revised in its application so that we only know what law to apply by looking back at the history of cases. Still, the point of studying the cases is to say what the applicable law is. And that process of studying and learning is often advanced by playing with the cases, changing their details, inventing possible or even impossible variations that test this or that understanding of the law as it is or as it might be. But these are all cases that have arisen or that can be imagined to arise in civil society and in everyday life. War, I want to argue, isn't a case to which the law and morality of everyday life can be applied. And by definition, it doesn't take place in civil society. It is a long-standing human practice, however uncomfortable we are with it, a long-standing human practice which represents a radical break with our ordinary social activities. The practice of war has been argued about and reflected on over many centuries. And it has its own law and even its own morality. 
which have been produced through the adaptation of ordinary law and morality to the peculiar circumstances of war. If we want to understand why that adaptation happened, why it was necessary, and what it has produced, we need to turn first to war itself. We need to understand what war is, how it has been experienced over the years, how its moral and legal rules have been worked out, and what the rules are now. And then we need to apply the rules to cases, that is to particular wars and to particular battles and to particular incidents in battles. And we need to come to grips with the tensions to which those applications are subject, the difficulties to which those applications are subject. And then, finally, we will be in a position to argue about possible changes of the rules. We can learn a lot about the rules and the tensions and the possibly necessary revisions by reading what international lawyers and just war theorists have written. But some of their key arguments will seem strange or incomprehensible unless we begin with the literature of war itself. It is especially strange that just war theory in its standard form requires us to judge the conduct of a war independently of the character of the war. So that what soldiers are permitted to do or barred from doing in battle doesn't depend on whether their war is just or not. I'm going to focus today on this strange requirement, which lies at the center of contemporary philosophical debates what the required independence of um, the character of the war the ca and the conduct of the war, what that required independence means is that we grant soldiers on both sides, whether their cause is just or unjust, an equal right to shoot their guns so long as they shoot only at each other and not at innocent civilians. We treat soldiers on the battlefield, on the battlefield, as moral equals. Most of the philosophers whose work I've been reading are highly critical of this equality and of the separation of ad bellum justice, the justice of the war itself, from in bello justice, the justice of the conduct of the war. They think it's obviously wrong to judge soldiers by how well they fight without reference to the rightness or wrongness of the war they are fighting. They want soldiers fighting a just war to be able to do things like shooting their guns that soldiers fighting an unjust war are barred from doing. And their argument makes a lot of sense. It is indeed um, the application of ordinary moral philosophy to war. And it makes a lot of sense if we imagine war to be a peacetime activity. So imagine that aggressive war is like a bank robbery in, say, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Let Philadelphia represent a peaceful civil society. We would certainly not want to judge the conduct of a robbery there independently of the wrongfulness of robbing banks, as if there's a nice way and a not nice way of robbing banks, as if the wrong of robbing banks doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference. If there is a shootout between a guard at the bank and the robber, it can't be the case that the two of them have an equal right to shoot so long as neither of them aims at innocent bystanders. The guard has rights that the robber obviously doesn't have. So by analogy, shouldn't we say that the, that the just warrior defending his country has rights that the unjust warrior invading the country doesn't have? This is the, the central challenge. There are others, some of them related to this one, this is the central challenge posed by contemporary moral philosophers to what they call the standard or conventional theory of just war. 
the theory that I have tried to defend. According to the standard theory, aggressive war is indeed a crime, but it isn't the crime of the ordinary soldiers who fight it. The criminals are the men and women, mostly men, the political and military leaders who consult together and decide, let's say they decide to attack a neighboring country. So the Nuremberg Tribunal got it right when it indicted the heads of the Nazi party, state, and army and allowed ordinary German soldiers to go home. But how can those soldiers be guiltless who marched into Poland, Russia, Belgium, France, and so many other countries? To answer that question, which I have now put in the strongest possible way, we must focus on what actually happens in the world of war. For this is a world where life is radically unlike life in Philadelphia or in any peaceful civil society, even one beset by armed and possibly violent bank robbers. So what is special, what is peculiar about war? I have a short list of features that moral and political theorists and philosophers should attend to. A list that I'm sure could be expanded. It's designed only to serve the immediate purposes of my argument today. First, the circumstances of war are intensely coercive. And they are coercive in ways that are probably not equaled anywhere else. Slavery and imprisonment are highly coercive institutions, and conscription for military service is sometimes compared to them by its opponents. That comparison can be useful in political debates, though it is certainly exaggerated. But it is hard to exaggerate the coerciveness of the battlefield, where life is always at risk, and soldiers are compelled to act in ways that have no precedent in their own or in any civilian experience. Command decisions are also subject to the coerciveness of war, hence the claim of military necessity. Moral theorists who try to set limits to that claim, as I tried to do in Just and Unjust Wars, must acknowledge its possible force. In the heat of battle, officers are driven to do cruel things which they would never imagine doing in domestic society by the belief that they have no alternative, or rather that the only alternative is defe defeat, which they take to mean subjection and possibly death, not so much for themselves as for their country and their fellow citizens. If we want sometimes to challenge that belief, as we should, we must understand the circumstances that produce it. Some of the legal and moral institutions of war acknowledge and even le legitimize its coerciveness. Consider the Prisoner of War Convention, which makes the practice of individual surrender on the battlefield possible. Surrender is an implicit agreement. The surrendering soldier, threatened with death, agrees to give up fighting and his captors agree, whether they think his war just or unjust, to provide him with what the lawyers call benevolent quarantine for the duration of the war. But this is an agreement that the captive has made under extreme duress. And according to the ordinary law and morality of domestic life, it cannot have any binding force. And yet we recognize and accept its binding force so that soldiers who try to escape from a prisoner of war camp are treated as if they have broken their word and thereby acted contrary to the law and morality of war. They are subject to punishment, even to capital punishment. I suppose one could argue that in the original position, as it is described by John Rawls, all potential soldiers would agree to the prisoner of war convention and that this hypothetical consent gives it binding force. But then we would have to explain why many prisoners try to escape and rejoin the fighting, and why we celebrate 
their efforts, why they are commonly described as heroes in books and films when they might plausibly be described as men who have broken their hypothetical or tacit promise and put a useful and humane convention at risk. The coerciveness of war explains the prisoner of war convention, for there's no other way to allow soldiers to stop fighting without being killed. But there is another feature of war that explains why some soldiers violate the convention and why we call them heroes. Second, war is an intensely collective and collectivizing experience. When political or moral theorists talk about war, and especially about just war, they commonly begin, as I began, with the right of individual self-defense. But this is only a bare beginning. And as an introduction to the understanding of warfare, it is somewhat misleading. Wars are fought by individuals, indeed, but not by individuals who are principally engaged in defending themselves. They are members of a collective to which they attach value, often great value, and they are engaged in a project that is not merely their own. Most often, the collective is a state, but it can also be a militant organization that functions like a state, recruits fighters for a cause, trains and organizes them, and sends them into battle. The cause of many militant organizations is to establish a state, the cause for which states organize armies or claim to organize armies is to defend their own existence and the common life and individual lives of their citizens. It is a fact of our moral history that many individuals are willing to risk their own lives for these causes. This is not easy to understand. If states exist primarily to defend life, then how can life be sacrificed to defend the state? That is the question posed most clearly in the political theory of Thomas Hobbes, to which he offered no satisfactory answer. And in fact, the defense of the state and the pursuit of the cause of any militant organization not only requires the defenders to put their own lives at risk, it requires them to put the lives of many other people at risk the fighters they oppose, most obviously, but also the civilians they and their opponents claim to be defending. Some philosophers working upward, so to speak, from individual self-defense doubt that any of this can be justified. The value of my life or yours may justify violent self-defense, but it is hard for these philosophers to understand how any collective could have that kind of value. They have not, however, succeeded in convincing the rest of us. Patriotism and loyalty are no doubt often misguided, but they shouldn't be incomprehensible. Collectives like the state or the army of the state are indeed instrumental. They have no intrinsic value. But they make possible, and then they defend another collective, a community whose existence is centrally important, is a centrally important value to its members or to the greater number of its members. This value has many sources, history and memory, traditions of belief and practice, a culture of political engagement, the continuity of families, the sense of place, the immediacy of a way of life. When these seem in danger, many of us will risk our lives in their defense. Even in ordinary times, we are all of us collectivists of some sort on behalf of our families or religious communities or nations or nation states. But this is a fairly weak collectivism, which only sometimes trumps individual self-interest. War strengthens and intensifies our collectivist sensibilities. And then the defense of the common life and of the necessary agencies of that defense, the state and the army, regularly trumps the defense of the self. That is why captured soldiers 
will sometimes try to escape from the prisoner of war camp. They want to resume the fighting and they are willing to accept the risks of doing that because they think that the victory of their nation or the success of their cause is critically important. The intensified collectivism of war also intensifies the coerciveness of war. In some wars, soldiers, in many wars, soldiers fight because they have been impressed or conscripted. But when the common life is in danger or when people think it is in danger, citizens will rush to enlist in the army. We call them volunteers, but they are probably acting under very strong social pressure and also under the pressure of their own consciences. Where conscience means what the word suggests, co-knowledge, the knowledge that they share with God in the original Protestant conception, or the knowledge they share with other members of their community in secular understandings. In wartime, and commonly with both versions of conscience, what young men and women know is that they ought to volunteer. Conscientious objection is exceptional even when it is permitted. They know that they ought to volunteer. This is collectivized knowledge, and it provides a powerful push toward what is only, in a highly qualified sense, a voluntary enlistment. Once you're in the army, you are a member of a very strong collective of combatants, and all the people you leave behind are members of another strong collective, the civilian population. These memberships are matters of life and death. Hence, they are strong in ways that no other memberships, no peacetime memberships, can ever be. I may be a committed professional, a lawyer, doctor, or teacher. I may be a devout member of a religious community, a class-conscious union worker, a, a political party activist, but none of these affiliations, though they are undoubtedly very important, is collectivized in as radical a way as combatants and non-combatants are. Where being a member determines whether you can or cannot be targeted and killed. Perhaps there are soldiers who, given the morality of everyday life, don't deserve to be targeted. They, they are against the war. They shoot their guns in the air. Perhaps there are civilians who do deserve to be targeted. They are fierce and uncompromising hawks. In the circumstances of war, we cannot make these distinctions. The moral equality of soldiers finds its parallel in the moral equality of civilians. Individuals are incorporated into both these collectives without regard to their personal moral standing. By contrast, in, peaceful, in peacetime civil society, life and death decisions are made, for example, in hospitals and courtrooms with careful attention to individual cases. Soldiers may receive that kind of attention after the war if they are put on trial for war crimes. But when the two armies are engaged, individual attentiveness isn't possible. The collectivism of war extends, so to speak, all the way down. It would be wrong to think of a battle as a series of encounters between individual soldiers. War is often chaotic, and soldiers are sometimes isolated from their units, forced to fight on their own, thinking at that moment only of their own survival. But battles commonly are collective engagements, shaped by a strategic plan, and then by the tactical decisions of field commanders, which are enforced by a rigorous military discipline. Soldiers fight together, helping each other, hoping to survive, but aiming at a local victory, a target destroyed, a hill captured, a road opened, an enemy battalion outflanked or surrounded. The local victory has value only as part of some larger scheme. But if that value is real to the soldiers involved, it justifies the risks they take, and it may justify, as self-defense would not, 
the risks they impose on nearby civilians. Soldiers often make individual decisions about the risks they take and the risks they impose, but they make these decisions in the context of the collectivism and the coerciveness of war. No one reading the literature of war can miss the sense of its strangeness and of its awfulness. To be forced to risk your life again and again for collective purposes, this is not what anyone wants for himself or for the people he cares about. He may think that it is important to fight. He may even think the cause is worth dying for, but he would rather be doing something else. The sense that many soldiers have of being radically committed and of wishing so strongly that they weren't, that too probably finds no easy equivalent in ordinary life. And this internally contradictory but emotionally empower powerful sense is common to soldiers on both sides of the battle. Indeed, soldiers on both sides recognize, if only intermittently, the feelings they share. They see themselves in the others, a poor sod just like me. Perhaps one can construct hypothetical cases that reproduce this feature or other features of wartime experience though I'm doubtful that take cases taken from civil society like the bank robber and the bank guard or any of the hypothetical and constructed cases actually get close enough. And I worry the theorists who are focused on these kinds of cases aren't thinking about war at all. They are not interested or better, they are not sufficiently interested in what actually happens on the battlefield and in what it feels like to be there. Third, war is a world of radical and pervasive uncertainty. The outcome of skirmishes and battles is hard to predict. The life chances of any particular soldier change from minute to minute. The knowledge available to officers making decisions is painfully limited. These physical and factual uncertainties probably can't be matched in ordinary civilian life and they exist alongside moral uncertainties that almost certainly can't be matched. Most often in civilian life, we have a fairly good idea about what ought to be done or about who can tell us what ought to be done. Moral practice has a certain habitual quality and moral and legal authority is routinized. But in the anarchic society of states, which is also the world of war, both morality and authority are radically contested. This doesn't mean that individual soldiers and groups of soldiers won't be convinced of the justice of their cause. They will be convinced, or most of them will, with whatever lingering anxieties. The soldiers of country A will follow the lead of their parents and peers, of their teachers and preachers, of their prime ministers and presidents. This is another example of the collectivizing tendency of warfare. The difficulty is that all these people, from parents to presidents, exist in two entirely separate sets. And the soldiers from country B, opponents of country A, will be equally convinced, and some of them similarly anxious, they will be following the same leads. And there is no one in the world, literally no one, to whom these two groups of soldiers can turn for impartial and authoritative guidance. Uncertainty exists, so to speak, at the highest level. In international society, there are virtually no cases where warring states and the neutral states watching them agree on a single moral, political, or military description of the war nor is there any routine way of appealing from this or that description to some ultimate judge. Wars end one way or another, but disagreement doesn't. The moral contests outlast the battles, as we can see if we read the history books produced for state schools in the victorious and in the defeated country. 
But what if a particular soldier knows that the war his country is fighting is unjust? Or what if the rest of us know that and think that he should know it too? How can he fight in such a war? How can anyone fighting unjustly claim a right to kill his opponents who are fighting justly? These are rhetorical questions. They are commonly asked by philosophers who insist that jus ad bellum determines jus in bello and who further insist that they know which of the warring states has ad bellum justice on its side. Reflecting on the certainty that, it seems to me, underlies these questions, I'm reminded of Oliver Cromwell's response to similar certainties among Puritan ministers during the English Revolution. Cromwell said to them, think ye in the bowels of Christ that ye may be wrong. That's not where I think, but I take the point. Given the circumstances of war, soldiers have a right to be wrong. And they have a right to think that they may be wrong and to defer to the decision of, let's say, their democratically elected leaders. They also have a right to think that though they should oppose the war as citizens and do, they are bound to fight it as soldiers because most states cannot survive in the world of war in international society as it exists today without a disciplined army. And finally, they have a right to refuse to fight in a war they believe to be unjust. And in cases like the Nazi war effort with which I began this argument, refusal is certainly the best response. But it is an act of heroism. And the worse the war effort is, the greater the heroism required to oppose it. And unheroic conduct can't be described as criminal conduct. But mostly, soldiers sincerely believe that their war is just for reasons that seem sufficient to them. And this belief gives a certain shape to their battles, which are fought between soldiers, certain of their cause in a world where all causes are uncertain. I'm not making a relativist argument here. I've argued for many years that most wars on one side or the other are objectively just or unjust. But this objectivity has no political or judicial embodiment. There is no agent of objectivity. And that is one reason for the deep principle of standard conventional just war theory that soldiers have an equal right to fight whether their cause is or isn't objectively just. Soldiers on both sides have exactly the same rights and obligations. If they are captured, they must be treated similarly and equally, that is, in accord with the morally strange prisoner of war convention. And after the war, they should be encouraged and helped in exactly the same way to go home and resume their civilian existence. In fact, all the special features of the world of war conspire to produce the principle of warrior equality, which obviously has no domestic equivalent. Again, bank robbers and bank guards are not equals, even if the bank turns into a battlefield. The different forms of wartime coerciveness social pressure, conscription, army discipline, military necessity, impact the soldiers on both sides in roughly the same way. The heightened sense of collective belonging and commitment is felt in similar ways by all of them, and they all live with the same uncertainties. If we want to constrain the conduct of soldiers on the battlefield, we must recognize these similarities. We must insist that all soldiers, whether they think their cause is just or unjust, and whether we think their cause is just or unjust, have the same rights, and what is even more important, the same obligations. No group of soldiers claiming to be just warriors can arrogate to themselves rights they deny to others or claim exemption from everyone else's obligations. 
for if that is allowed and justified, there will soon be no constraints at all. The moral equality of soldiers on the battlefield is perhaps the strangest rule of war. But the philosophers who deny its morality seem to me to miss the force of that important preposition, rule of war. To understand the rule, you have to take an interest not only in moral theory, which accounts for the strangeness of the rule, you also have to take an interest in war, which accounts for the existence of the rule. Thank you.